The seven-second delay for live television was introduced in 1975 by NBC so that Richard Pryor could host Saturday Night Live without the network getting fined for all of his obscenities. The delay would also be useful, we discovered, if a man were to be shot point-blank in the head, live on national television. What you just heard was a clip from American Hostage. The man that sparked the fear of a live execution was Tony Karitsis, the subject of today's episode. We will be sharing more information on American Hostage later in this episode. A listener note, this episode contains adult content and is not suitable for everyone. Please be advised. America in the 1970s was in turmoil. The Watergate scandal had undermined trust in the government, a trust already made unstable from the war in Vietnam. Inflation rates and gas prices were skyrocketing. The effects of the civil rights movement were still settling in. As these changes took hold, Banks and corporations were seen as enemies, machines that everyday people were trying to fight against. The reflection of this in film gave way to the rise of the anti-hero. Movies like Taxi Driver, Dog Day Afternoon, Network, and One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest scored big in the box office, with people relating to the little guy rising up against the man. Tony Karitsis was one of those people that identified with these antiheroes. He aspired to be a character who went up against the machine, and even if he did not win, he was willing to go down in a blaze of glory. And that was the attitude that Tony Karitsis seemed to have on February 8, 1977, when he went to the offices of the company that held his mortgage. Tony wired a sawed-off shotgun to the back of the head of the president of the company. Tony was going to expose the perceived injustices he felt the company had inflicted on him. To borrow a line from the 1976 film Network, He was mad as hell, and he wasn't going to take it anymore. What ensued was a 63-hour hostage crisis broadcast live on TV and radio. One way or another, Tony Karitsis was determined to be the hero of his own story. From Wondery and Treefort, I'm Candace DeLong, and this is Killer Psyche. I've spent five decades studying people's minds through my work as an FBI profiler and psychiatric nurse. I've interviewed lots of murderers, including serial killers. And the question of why they did it is what I get asked time and time again. It is difficult to get a satisfying answer without diving deep into their mindsets. So that's what we're doing. And I will give you my best analysis in this series of what made them do what they did. This episode is Tony Karitsis. It was freezing cold in Indianapolis, Indiana on February 8, 1977. 42-year-old Richard Hall, also known as Dick, was running late to an appointment with a client at his downtown office. Dick was the president of Hall and Hoddle, a holding company which had mortgage, construction, and real estate businesses. Dick's father, Millard, also known as ML, 
started at Hall and Hoddle in 1930 and was still chairman of the firm. But his sons had now taken up running the day-to-day business. Dick's brothers, William and Jack, headed up the mortgage and construction companies, while Dick ran real estate management and served as the company's president. While his father was snowbirding in Florida, Dick took a meeting with one of his father's most troublesome clients, Tony Karitsis. When he finally arrived for their appointment, Tony was already waiting. The 44-year-old Tony had a sling on his left arm, and with his right arm, he carried rolled-up blueprints. A long white box about five feet in length sat on a coffee table in front of him. However, despite the below-freezing temperatures outside, he was not wearing a coat. Dick greeted Tony, inquired about his injured arm, and then immediately ushered him into the office so they could spread out his blueprints on a large conference table. More than four years earlier, in December of 1972, the Halls Company lent Tony $110,000 to develop a 17-acre property on the western side of Indianapolis. Tony renewed the loan two years later, and then in October of 1975, he received an appraisal valuing the 17 acres at $575,000. A supermarket chain wanted to buy six and a half of those acres and offered Kuritzis $65,000 an acre. Since this would give Tony a tremendous profit and also allow him to keep 10 acres, the Halls encouraged him to accept the offer. Against their advice, Tony counteroffered with a ridiculous number. The chain decided to purchase a different property. So, he refinanced his mortgage for a third time in February of 1976. This time, it was for $130,000, which incorporated the interest on the original loan. Tony was now left with no offers and a lot of debt. The Halls had given Tony two payment extensions already after his automatic renewal. It had been 50 months since the original loan was made, and Tony had not yet made a single payment except for a portion of the interest. The Halls warned him there would be no more extensions. And that meant the $130,000 Tony owed had to be paid by March 1st, 1977. If he could not satisfy the entire loan, the company was prepared to foreclose on the property. That deadline was now less than three weeks away. Tony was getting desperate. Once inside the office, Tony shut the door, claiming that his shorts were bothering him and he needed to adjust them. Dick turned his back to give Tony some privacy and unrolled the blueprints on the conference table. A minute later, Tony ordered Dick to turn around, and when he did, he saw Tony had discarded his sling and was pointing a small silver revolver at his face. Tony told him, This is serious, Dick. I'm going to wire a shotgun to your neck. Tony ordered Dick to remove his sport coat and tie and squat down. He turned up the collar on Dick's shirt and wrapped a wire around Hall's neck. He then attached the wire to the muzzle of a 12-gauge sawed-off shotgun. The barrel was pointed at the base of Dick Hall's skull. The wire was secured down the length of the barrel and hooked onto the trigger. Caritzis also looped wire around the trigger and a ring on his finger. Tony called this a dead man's line because if he were to be killed, 
the weight of his body falling would pull the trigger and kill his hostage. Here's the deal about sawed-off shotguns. They are illegal in most states because removing the 18 to 30 inch long barrel makes them concealable. And it also makes them more deadly. Even being in possession of one, let alone threatening someone with it, is a federal felony. And that can attract a penalty of 10 years in prison. If an owner wants to alter the barrel of their shotgun, Approval by the ATF is mandatory. Tony then picked up the office phone and called 911. At this point, Tony was extremely volatile. His conversation with the police dispatch operator was filled with profanity. He told the operator he had a hostage and was going to kill him unless his demands were met. Tony, however, was hard of hearing in his left ear and could not clearly hear the dispatcher. He also could not switch the handset to his right ear because his right hand was wired to the trigger of the gun. So for almost an hour, Tony Karitsis demanded that two Indianapolis police officers he was friendly with come to his location. Despite the dispatcher repeatedly asking for an address, Tony did not answer the question, presumably because he did not hear it. Tony's frustrations were compounded when it was discovered that those two officers were off duty and the police were having trouble tracking them down. Remember, the cell phone era was decades away. No longer willing to wait, Tony pushed his hostage out of the office and he demanded two officers accompany him outside. The police had cut off power to the elevators, so Tony had to march his hostage down the stairwell. Outside the building, multiple police officers were waiting on the street, unsure of what to do next. Screaming profanities, Tony threatened to, quote, blow Hall's head off if anyone got close to them. And I can assure you, that's exactly what a shotgun blast that close to the head would do. I've seen it. He pushed Hall down one of the main streets in downtown Indianapolis as officers walked helplessly alongside Tony and Dick, directing shocked pedestrians to clear the streets and go inside. It was 17 degrees outside, but both Tony and Dick were in short sleeves. When a rookie officer attempted to draw his weapon, Tony turned to scream at him, yanking on the wire collar as he turned. It was at that heart-stopping moment when Tony slipped on a patch of ice. Both men fell to the ground, but the gun miraculously did not go off. Shocked, Tony screamed, the gun didn't go off. The gun didn't go off. Dick, the gun didn't go off. Tony seemed as shocked as everyone watching. Frankly, I think it was a miracle that the gun did not fire. Sheer luck. Tony was no doubt happy about that because had that gun gone off and Hall was killed, Tony would have been killed by the police immediately. Getting up, Tony continued making his way down the road. The police followed him for five and a half blocks. At that point, Tony commandeered an empty police car left with its engine running door open and red lights flashing. Before he got into the vehicle, Tony removed the handcuffs from the belt of the officer who was walking near him. He then sat down in the driver's seat, slid over to the passenger side, and pulled Hall into the police car. 
Dick drove eight miles west to Tony's apartment complex. As they exited the vehicle, Tony screamed that he had booby-trapped his apartment with explosives, so police immediately evacuated all 110 residents from the complex. Tony had a one-bedroom apartment on the third floor. Inside, he strung fishing line throughout, and later it was discovered he had constructed a Rube Goldberg type of contraption with a lit candle hovering over two gallons of gasoline. If vibrations from a gun or force were applied to the door, then the candle would drop into the gasoline. Police feared there could be dynamite or nitroglycerin present, which could spark a gasoline fire and further complicate rescue efforts. But fortunately, there was nothing else. Tony handcuffed Dick, sat him down at the dining room table, and turned the wire collar from the back of his head to his face. Tony then propped up the shotgun on two telephone books, telling him he was lucky to be taken hostage by a man with a steady hand. To prove his point, Tony grasped the shotgun, put his finger on the trigger, then took it off, and then put his finger back on the trigger. He did this several times, teasing his hostage, quote, see how steady my hand is? Tony was tying up the line with calls to family and friends complaining about the media's false reports about his past. Reporters and the general public who were watching the events unfold on live television found Tony's name listed in the phone book and started calling him, which also jammed up the phone line. Negotiators were finally able to get through at 2.30 p.m. Tony made four demands. First, that the mortgage company issue a public apology to him. Second, they drop the $130,000 loan repayment and pay him unspecified damages for his pain and suffering. Third, he would not undergo any psychiatric evaluations. And lastly, he wanted complete immunity for kidnapping Hall and all related charges. Tony also let negotiators know he had enough food to last a week. He also told them he was willing to kill Hall and die himself if his demands were not met. That night, Tony took the dead man's line off Dick Hall's neck and forced him to lie down on the bathroom floor. Then he chained and padlocked Dick's handcuffs to the base of the toilet. At 9 p.m., an employee of Dick's company read an apology that was broadcast on local television. Tony's brother, George, went to the apartment door to ask if he heard the apology. Tony confirmed he did, and then said he wanted to stop talking for the night and sleep on it. The next morning, a Wednesday, Tony called in to WIBC AM radio station and asked to speak to Fred Heckman, the station's popular on-air news director. Tony said he was a longtime listener to Heckman's morning reports and believed he was an honest man who could correct the media portrayal of him as a crazed lunatic. Heckman advised Tony that while the episode was live on air, he was recording their conversations for rebroadcast. He calmly interviewed Karitzis about his grievances while also trying to tamp down Tony's profanity and volatile rants. Tony believed that Dick's company intentionally interfered in his development plan so they could eventually foreclose on his property and take it from him. He also told Heckman that the statement read to the public the night before was, quote, totally inadequate. 
Tony and Fred Heckman had seven phone calls during the hostage crisis. Heckman later said he was in constant fear for Dick Hall's life. By noon on Wednesday, Tony let his hostage talk to negotiators and state police that he had food and water, and he also allowed him to call his wife. In between talking to negotiators and monitoring the news, Tony held court sessions with Hall. He would say, Dick, we're going to have a little trial here, and I'm going to be the prosecutor, the judge, and the jury. You're going to have to answer all the questions, and I'm going to convict you. Before taking Dick Hall as his hostage, Tony prepared over 200 file cards with typed statements for his mock trial, but they never got through them all. Tony also played other card games with Dick, but his screaming fits never stopped. At one point, he hit Hall on the back of his head with his pistol, hard enough to cause a laceration. Later that second day, Tony flew into a rage when he heard reports that a bomb squad was going to enter the building. To appease Tony, negotiators offered to give him immunity. At 7 p.m. on Wednesday, February 9th, negotiators slid a one-page statement from the Marion County prosecutor under the apartment door, granting full immunity from criminal prosecution for the kidnapping and any other charges. That evening, the deputy district attorney read the terms of the immunity agreement on live television. Still, the next morning, the beginning of day three, Tony remained holed up in his apartment with Dick. He was now demanding a promissory note for $5 million. Tony's demands were escalating, but why wouldn't they? He thought he was getting everything he wanted, so why not ask for more? $5 $5 million in 1977 was like asking for the moon. He also said that he needed a key for the handcuffs Hall was wearing. One of his wrists was swollen because the handcuffs were on too tight. Police sent a key and then expected Karitsis to walk out of the apartment, set his shotgun down in the hallway, and release his hostage as the kidnapper and negotiators had agreed. But just 30 minutes later, the negotiations broke down. Tony was angry and wanted documentation of the $5 million he would be paid by Hall's company. An FBI profiler who was brought to the scene directed police to create a stage in the lobby of the apartment building across from Tony's. The profiler believed that by assembling the police and media there, it would lure Tony out. And he was correct. At 10.20 p.m., Karitsis unexpectedly marched Hall out of his apartment with the dead man's line still around Hall's neck and the barrel of the shotgun still aimed at Hall's head. Tony pushed Hall into the recreation room where all the media was gathered. He shouted at reporters to turn on their cameras. While the cameras were rolling, Tony handed a list of his grievances to Dick Hall and demanded he read them. Barely able to talk with the wire around his neck, Dick started reading. But Tony got angry because he felt that Dick's delivery was too monotone. Tony clearly needed to be in control of everything. He ripped the paper out of Dick's hands and said, I'll read it. I'm the one who was called a kidnapper. I'm a goddamn national hero, and don't you forget it. It took almost 30 minutes for Tony to finish reading because he kept stopping to curse the Hall family and berate the media. 
during his speech, Tony was extremely emotional, even tearing up at times. To those in the room, it looked like he was going to shoot Hall. Tony even told them, quote, I've had a gun stuck in this cocksucker's head for three days. They've had one stuck in mine for four and a half years. I hope this gun doesn't go off. I'm having too much fun. Some TV stations then dropped their live broadcast, believing Tony was going to kill Hall on live television. Finally satisfied that all of his demands were met, Karitsis and Hall were led down the hall by police to the command post. There, the police used wire cutters to remove the wire around Hall's neck. He was immediately whisked away and transported to the hospital. He was shaken, fatigued, and dehydrated. Tony had only fed him one plate of salami and cheese and only permitted him to use the bathroom once during his 63 hours of captivity. But he was alive. Still holding the shotgun, Tony announced to the room full of police officers, quote, I've wanted to fire this thing ever since I've had it. Then he walked to an open patio door pointed the barrel of the shotgun skyward and pulled the trigger. Police quickly grabbed Tony and arrested him. Tony was surprised and called it a cheap-ass shot. Tony, you lied. You said you would let that man go before you came down. The media, hearing the shot, feared the worst. But miraculously, after 63 hours of sheer terror, everyone was still alive. Anthony Tony Karitsis was born August 13, 1932, to Greek immigrant parents. He had three brothers, a sister, and one half-brother. He was reportedly a sickly child. At the age of seven, Tony began working at his parents' store, selling ice cream. He claimed his father had him working 12-hour days when he was just nine years old. Although he was a good student, his after-school job left him barely any time to do homework or socialize with his peers. In high school, he worked up to 70 hours a week. While his classmates were out dating and playing ball, he claimed he was a 75-pound kid pushing a 150-pound cart. His father was physically abusive but Tony testified he still loved him. His mother, who was much more nurturing, died of cancer at the age of 41. When his mother died, Tony was distraught. He put his high school ring in her coffin and, according to one of his brothers, lost his faith in God. After graduating high school, he went into the army where he became an expert in demolition, explosives, and booby traps. At the rank of corporal, he even became a small arms instructor at West Point for a time. Tony was not a big man. He stood only five foot seven and weighed approximately 150 pounds. He did not seem to have any romantic relationships. He never married and later revealed he never even had a long-term relationship. After leaving the military, Tony joined one of his brothers and sister in managing his family's mobile home park in Indianapolis. Residents there recalled him walking around the park with a shotgun and enforcing the five-mile-per-hour speed limit. Tony was rigid about which workmen were permitted on his property. 
threatening all whom he felt had trespassed. In 1967, he had a disagreement with two of his brothers over money. He shot at them, but luckily missed. He was arrested for assault and battery with intent to kill. But the detective who arrested him was a friend, and the charges were minimized. Tony was released. The very next year, Tony barricaded himself and his invalid sister inside her home for two days at gunpoint. He wanted to leave the family business and demanded $55,000 he felt his family owed him. They agreed to give him the money, which he eventually used to purchase the 17 acres. The family never pressed charges against him. His sister even said after the incident, we love Tony. On December 19, 1972, Tony took out a loan from Dick Hall's company. The company had not wanted to loan Tony the money, but Dick's father, ML, believed in Tony and championed his cause. He liked the idea that Tony was a self-starter, and he wanted to support him. Tony worked on clearing the land himself, but became protective of his property just as he did at his family's mobile home park. In 1974, police were called when Tony wielded an axe at utility workers installing a gas pipe running underneath his land. Once again, he stayed out of jail. After Tony received offers on his 17 acres from the grocery store chain, he reportedly acted paranoid and suspicious. This type of paranoia is reminiscent of what we covered in our episode on Andrew Kehoe. I put Tony in the same category as him. Both men were middle-aged when they exploded and furiously angry with the man who they perceived as cheating them and destroying their lives. Both of them developed paranoia. Both blamed everyone but themselves for their financial problems, and neither could control their anger. Both Kehoe and Karitsis had explosive tempers and could not be reasoned with, and both took very desperate measures to make their point that the establishment was the demon, not them. One factor that could have contributed to this is the male climacteric, or what is commonly known as male menopause. And yes, that's a real thing. It has also been referred to as the middle age crazies. According to the American Psychiatric Association, male climacteric is a hypothetical period in some men's lives that can be compared to female menopause. It appears to be associated with declines in the levels of various hormones, such as testosterone. The National Health Service reports that, and I quote, some men develop depression, loss of sex drive, erectile dysfunction, and other physical and emotional symptoms when they reach their late 40s to early 50s. Other symptoms common in men this age are mood swings and irritability, loss of muscle mass, fat redistribution, a general lack of enthusiasm or energy, difficulty sleeping, insomnia, poor concentration, and short-term memory loss. These symptoms can interfere with everyday life and happiness so it's important to find the underlying cause and work out what can be done to resolve it. Tony's claim that the Halls cheated him out of his land deal was 100% false. And Tony later told one of his police officer friends he had been planning the kidnapping for three and a half years at a time when he still had loan extensions granted to him. In fact, Tony even rearranged his apartment to mirror Hall's office layout to prepare for the big event. Later, he told the staff at Hall & Hoddle 
that he was getting surgery on his arm. It was a ploy to add validity to the sling he wore the day he took Dick Hall hostage, the sling that hid his gun. So what's the answer as to why Tony committed that spectacular abduction and hostage taking? What was going on with him, or should I say, in him? Dr. Stephen Diamond, a forensic psychologist and an expert in the psychology of mass murderers, evaluated violent offenders for 15 years for the California court system. He came to a few conclusions about this type of criminal mind. Quote, for me, the one underlying force influencing most violent behavior is pathological anger, rage, resentment, and embitterment. By pathological, he means anger that is way over the top, excessive, destructive, debilitating, and abnormal. He goes on to say, quote, violent offenders in general, with the possible exceptions of those who commit impulsive and unpremeditated crimes of passion or suffer from some sudden medical crisis or neurological impairment, don't just snap. They slowly and insidiously bend, stew, simmer, and then boil before erupting or exploding. And that is a perfect description of Tony Karitsis. Some of these offenders are very good at hiding their feelings and behaviors of rage and resentment from those around them. But Tony didn't hide his feelings. He broadcast them to the world. Diamond explains that for these types of criminals, quote, their embitterment builds over time, eventually becoming toxic and pathological. As this happens, the embitterment begins to become a fantasy, sometimes intrusive, such as an unwanted obsession. The fantasy itself, the content of the fantasy, is of exacting revenge on the people the killer, in this case, the offender, perceives is to blame for his problems. Tony blamed Hall's mortgage company for his failure to pay his obligations. If the offender's fantasy continues to grow wild, unchecked or ignored, and there was no evidence Tony sought help, the vengeful and sometimes murderous fantasies turn into a reality. And as we've already discussed, Tony had a habit of holding people hostage at gunpoint to get the money he believed they owed him. It's not unusual to see evidence of premeditation and significant planning of the massacres, or in Tony's case, of the hostage taking by these type of violent offenders, primarily because they are, in most cases, not seriously mentally ill or legally insane. Tony knew what he had planned was wrong, and he said as much many times. Make no mistake, Tony Karitsis was not overtly psychotic. To be sure, he was disturbed, but he was not out of touch with reality. He was not hearing voices. He was in control of his behavior. That said, I would not want to be in his crosshairs. But there's another psychological disorder that I think fits Tony. Paranoid Delusional Disorder. People with this very serious disorder appear to be in the grips of a delusion. Perhaps you recall this from our two-part episode on Susan Polk. She was normal 80% of the time, and 20% of the time believed her husband was out to kill her. But these people are not in the grips of a bizarre delusion, such as Richard Chase in episode 11. He believed his blood was turning to dirt and he had to replace it. That is known as a bizarre delusion. 
and only seriously mentally ill, i.e. insane, people suffer from that. I think Tony Karitsis is in the Susan Polk category of someone suffering from paranoid delusional disorder. But Tony's 20% of the time being paranoid and delusional made him, as it did Susan Polk, very dangerous. Only hearing Tony's side of the story on radio and TV, some of the public began to regard him as a hero. They believed that like the movies of the time, Tony was sticking it to the man. Strangers started a fund for his defense, some of them empathizing because they too had been foreclosed on by a bank. They did not see Dick Hall as a person. They saw him as a symbol of greed. In their mind, Tony Karitsis was David to Dick Hall's Goliath. Tony was charged with the felonies of armed kidnapping, inflicting physical injury in the commission of a crime, commission of a crime of violence while armed, obtaining a signature by threat, and armed robbery. His bail was set at $750,000. He was soon transferred to Marion County Jail. Another charge of disorderly conduct was added and bail increased to $850,000. The deputy county prosecutor stated there was never any intention of honoring the terms of immunity which were signed under duress. During his arraignment, the judge ordered him to have a psychiatric evaluation, something Tony had adamantly opposed during hostage negotiations. It's entirely possible since Tony was a big fan of TV and movies, that he was afraid a psychiatric evaluation would lead to a lobotomy, such as the anti-hero in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest suffered. Tony wanted to plead not guilty and say that because Hall and company had swindled him, his actions were justified. His lawyer told him that was not a defense and would get him life in prison. At his lawyer's insistence, Tony finally agreed to plead not guilty by reason of insanity. In the late 70s in Indiana, it was the prosecution's burden to prove the defendant was sane, not like today where the defendant must prove they are insane. Tony Karitsis's trial began October 6th 1977, the jury of seven men and five women were sequestered in a hotel near the courthouse. The defense attorney told the jury there was no fraud on the part of Hall and Hoddle Mortgage Company, and Karitsis' act of taking Hall hostage was irrational. The defense also called over 20 witnesses, mostly friends and family, who testified Tony was not acting normally during the hostage-taking. Dick Hall took the witness stand the first day. He stoically recounted how Karitsis repeatedly threatened to, quote, blow my head off if I disobeyed instructions, fainted, or slipped. Jurors might have found the calm and unemotional Dick Hall cold and detached on the stand, whereas Tony wept openly and often throughout the trial. If you recall during the hostage taking, Tony would alternate between screaming and yelling and venting his rage to crying. And here he is doing it in court. This is called being emotionally labile. Who else is labile? A two-year-old. One minute they're happy, the next minute they're screaming. When Tony took the witness stand, it was clear 
that he was extremely paranoid. But that does not fit the legal definition of insane. Lots of people are paranoid, and they don't commit crimes. Most of the nine mental health experts who testified at the trial believe Tony was sane. A court-appointed psychiatrist said that based on his observations, Tony was not insane, and he fell into the classification of paranoid personality, not psychotic or neurotic type. Today, that is known as paranoid delusional disorder. Tony also had deep-rooted feelings of insecurity and inferiority. Only one psychiatrist believed from the time he spent observing Tony that he was insane. Of course, Tony did not fully cooperate with the evaluations. On October 21st, 1977, the jury came back and delivered a verdict of not guilty by reason of insanity. A female juror hugged Tony after the trial. When the verdict was announced over the PA system during the Indiana Pacers basketball game, the crowd reportedly cheered. Tony Karitsis had achieved folk hero status in a certain percentage of the public's mind. Still, politicians and much of America were outraged by the verdict. The Indiana legislature immediately decided to rewrite the laws so that the burden of proof of insanity switched to the defendant. The next year, laws around the country followed suit. But Tony Karitsis was not able to walk free. On November 9th, the judge once again ordered him to undergo a psychiatric evaluation, which Tony still refused to do. He was held in contempt of court and was sent to a psychiatric hospital. Life was not as kind to Dick as it was to Tony. In 1978, a year after the kidnapping, his father, ML, died. His two brothers followed suit and both passed away prematurely in 1979 and 1981. Due to climbing interest rates and the much-held, although fallacious, claim that his family swindled Tony, Dick's company experienced a precipitous downturn. With his business failing, Dick almost lost his family home to foreclosure. He started drinking heavily and in 1992 was arrested for a DUI. He then joined Alcoholics Anonymous and became sober. However, his wife filed for divorce shortly after. Dick Hall refused to discuss his ordeal with Tony Karitsis with anyone until 2017, when he finally released a book on the subject. His children encouraged him to write his story to help him heal. The PTSD he must have suffered would have been profound. Because Tony was thought to be dangerous and would not submit to any psych evaluations, he was held in contempt of court. But rather than serving time in prison for that, he spent 11 years in custody of state mental hospitals. If he had cooperated and undergone an evaluation, he probably would have been released in a fraction of that time. But the truth clearly is, Tony was not a well man. He finally agreed to be examined in 1987, and a judge released him in 1988 after the state failed to prove he was still a danger to the public. Tony Karitsis passed away from natural causes in January of 2005. He died at the age of 74. To hear the dramatization of Tony's story, follow American Hostage wherever you get your podcasts or binge all episodes on Amazon Music and Wondery Plus. 
The following is a full trailer for American Hostage. This podcast is based on a true story. He says he had been planning this for four years, according to my information here. Did he come in with a shotgun? How did you know? Evidently, he made a bad real estate deal, and he's going to settle it. He has a shotgun wired to the neck of his victim. Looks like we're going to be here quite a long time. Good afternoon. I'm Fred Heckman with WIBC. Tuesday, February 8th. 1977. You're a workaholic, Fred. Yeah. That takes a toll on other things. Hey, it's been a slow year. Indianapolis 911, it's your emergency. I've done a thing, a real serious thing, the kind of thing you aren't used to hearing about, I bet. For me, there are three tenets of journalism. One, don't make it personal. Two, don't pick a side. And three, don't become the story. I broke all three of those in the span of a single phone call. Hello, this is Fred Heckman with WIBC. This is really Fred Heckman. Yes. <laughs> we got something developed in downtown. Something developed. If you're going to help me straighten this out for me, Mr. Heckman, you know I trust you. You want an interview? Yes. The WIBC News Division speaking directly to the hostage taker is a disaster. What they're doing right now is character assassination, and I need the record set straight. He doesn't trust the system. He's a psychopath. He needs an outlet. You can't go down there. He does have a background in explosives. Anything you say, anything you do could get this guy's head blown off. You get him to move back right the hell now. Every hour that goes by, every minute, the hostage becomes less of a person, less of a human. Do you have a wife and family, Fred? I sure do, Tony. Let's say somebody set you up and they said, we're going to take your car, we're going to take your house, we're going to take your wife, we're going to take your children, and then they're going to laugh at you. Would you be ready to kill Heckman? Well, I'd, I'd Would you go. be ready to kill Heckman? I'd be awfully mad, sir. American Hostage is an Amazon original and criminal content production starring John Hamm, Carla Gucci, Joe Perino, Dylan Baker, and Becky Ann Baker. Follow American Hostage wherever you get your podcasts, or you can binge all eight episodes right now on Amazon Music and Wondery Plus. We'll be back in a moment right after this station break. Next week on Killer Psyche, Mark Thundercloud, the retired supervisory special agent of the FBI's Crisis Negotiation Unit at Quantico. From Wondery and Treefort Media, this is Killer Psyche. I'm your host, Candace DeLong. This episode was written and produced by Lisa Ammerman and Julie Burke. Edited by Joshua Morales and Maxwell Carney, with research and editing assistance from Ann Liu. Our senior audio producer is Tom Monahan. Renee Levesque is production manager. And Haley Mandelberg is production coordinator. Brandon Clark and Lindsay Whistler are production assistants. And the line producer is Oscar Guido. Our executive producers are Kelly Garner, and Lisa Ammerman for Treeport, and Marsha Louie and Aaron O'Flaherty for Wondery. The series is produced by Wondery and Treeport Media.